and the incredible job they do every Sunday. So good to see you guys. Are you happy to be here this morning? Good, good, good. Go ahead and grab a seat as you sit down. I just want you to know that we begin a brand new series today. It's called Good and Plenty. Real quick, raise your hand if you'd like the candy, Good and Plenty. And if you're like me, you don't. Raise your hand. But that's all right. It's just the name of a series, so don't get too upset about it. Hey, grab your Bible, your notes, your pen, and get ready to write a few things down this morning. How many of you liked the extra hour sleep? Whew, that felt good, didn't it? I, I vote that we do that every week. Huh? <laughs> every week, let's just add an extra hour. One hour is not enough. Let's, let's, I, I need more. I need more. How many of you need some more sleep in your life? Yeah, I need more sleep. That's not the only thing I need more of. You know what else I need more of? I need more championship rings in Atlanta. That's what I need more of. Anybody with me on that? Yeah? You know what else I need more of? I need more French fries than they gave me at McDonald's yesterday. No, I need more fries. You know, there's a lot of things in my life I think I need more of. A lot of things in our life that we all think we need more of. You know, you know who you're like? You know who I'm like? We are all like Mick. You know, Mick. He couldn't get no satisfaction. <laughs> Even though he tried and he tried and he tried and he tried, he couldn't get no satisfaction. I can't get no satisfaction. In so many areas of my life, and I can try, and I can try, and I can try, and I can try, but sometimes I just get no satisfaction. I want more. I'm living in a way where I might not be so content. Contentment? Yeah, that's what we're talking about here in the next several weeks, how to live a contented life. And instead of taking cues from Mick, we're going to take cues from the Apostle Paul, who said, I figured it out. I discovered how to live in contentment in life. Now, now let's pause for a second right here, though, okay? Because as we talk about contentment, some people will automatically go and think that desire is bad, desire is wrong, desire, any, anytime we desire anything, that would be evil, but that is not true. In fact, God designed you, God made you, God put in you desire. This time of year, he put in squirrels the desire for those acorns that are falling in your yard. And what do they do? They, they run around, they gather them up, and they store them away so that they can survive the winter. God put desire in, in, in little birds, the desire to go gather up straw so they can build a nest, right? God put desire in my labradoodles, the desire every morning for a walk and the, the desire to have their belly rubbed. God put desire in his creatures and God put desire in you. He put desire in you for the great things that he put in this world to enjoy them, but it's when desire gets out of control that it becomes terribly, terribly harmful in our life. It's when desire begins to control us that can cause so much damage in our lives. Real quick, before we write anything that's on your outline right here, I want you to write down some of the Negative things that desire can bring into your life when it is out of control. Some of the negative effects of living a life of not being contented. Number one, exhaustion. Just worn out. It just, you're going so hard and so fast and so much all the time that, that you just can't keep up. Your body begins to break. You end up going, man, I want an extra hour's sleep every week. I need it. 
can lead to exhaustion. Not only exhaustion, number two, write this word down somewhere, wherever, wherever you want to on your outline, debt. Living a life without contentment can lead to some serious debt in our lives, right? We get overextended. We think we've got to have this or have that. And so we go out and get it, even though we can't afford it. And debt begins to chew us up and spits us out. And not only that, uh, write, write this down. It can lead to ruined relationships. Uh, we're not so content with, with this person in our life anymore that we want to move on to this person because that's where we'll find happiness. We trade this model in for that model over there. And it can destroy our relationships in our life. Not only that, here's another one. Write this down, number four, just wherever you want to put it on. It can lead to a poor self-image. It can lead to a poor self-image. As we begin to look and compare and evaluate ourselves based on what we have or, or, or the, the stuff that we packed away or the way we look, it, it can lead to a terrible, terrible, poor self-image because we're basing our value on the stuff that we think we've got to have. So those are all some of the effects, the negative effects of living without contentment in our lives. But, but now let's look to what Paul says here in Philippians chapter 4, talking about how to live or the secret to living a contented life. He says in verses 11 through 12, I have learned how to be content with whatever I have. Let's pause here for a second. And some of you already know this, that Paul is writing this letter to the Philippians and he's writing it from prison. And he's actually telling them, hey, thanks for the gift that you sent to me, but I do just want you guys to know that I've learned how to live and be content in whatever situation it is that I found myself in. Let's read it. I have learned how to be content with whatever I have. I know how to live on almost nothing or with everything. I have learned the secret of living in every situation, whether it is with a full stomach or empty, with plenty or little. Now take your pen, if you will, and go back and circle two words on here. The two words I want you to circle is the word secret and the word learned. Secret and learned. Paul says, I know the secret, but the secret is something that you have to learn. How do we learn it? We begin to put it into practice. You're going to see that we go to a lot of the writings, primarily though from Philippians here where Paul is writing, and we look for that secret of how to live a life of contentment. But please understand, all that we write down here today... It doesn't matter if we leave here and don't put it into practice. When we put it into practice, when we start taking those steps, then we begin to reprogram our minds in the way that we live each and every day. So what is the secret and how is it that we can walk in it and learn it here today? Number one, resist comparing myself to others. The first thing is to resist comparing myself to others. What season is it? Thanksgiving, which leads into? You know what season it is? Tis the season to covet. Tis the season to covet. What do I mean? In my mailbox, every day of the week right now, I only basically get two types of mail. You know what those are? Number one, catalogs, and number two are credit card offers. Yeah, that's all there is. It's all the junk mail. But in those catalogs, what happens? Well, I'll go and I'll grab those catalogs. It seems to be a stack now every day. Catalog after catalog after catalog. And I'm like, why are they sending this stuff? But you begin to look through the catalog. And what do you find in the catalog? Well, well you see people dressed all nice. You see these models, and they're wearing these clothes, and, and you begin to look at it and go, "Woo, I'd look good too like that. Look at the way. And, and we begin to compare ourselves. We begin to say, you know what? I need this, and I need this, and this is why I need this, because I'm, and we compare ourselves 
to what we see in the magazines. We compare ourselves to what we see on the ads on TV. We compare ourselves to what we see on Facebook. We compare ourselves to what we see on Instagram. Why do we compare? We compare because we have insecurities. We compare because we have insecurities in our life. And if we go on this or we look at this and we compare ourselves to this person or this person, there is that, that, that whew, for a second, I feel a little better about myself if I compare myself and I think I'm better. But more often than not, we compare and we come up even more inadequate than we were before, even feeling worse than we were before. We make comparisons, and then here comes the credit card offer, and we say, well, if I get this, then I can be that. If I go and get this now, then I can be this. Swipe, 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 swipe. All in an effort, all in an effort to find significance in this world in which we live. And man, they do know what they're doing, do they not? The advertisers on TV, they know how to sell it to us over and over. You guys have heard just recently in the news that Instagram has been a long time aware that Instagram is harmful, especially to young teenage girls. Why? Because it's all about comparing, all about comparing, all about comparing. And it creates this desire in us, this desire to go and get this or have this. Or if I could just have this body, if I could just have this look, if I could just have this car, if I could just have this thing over here, then I would feel better about myself. And we go and go and go and pursue and pursue and pursue. This time of year, more than any other time of the year, our wanometer is off the charts. And so we chase after it. Galatians, Paul writes something interesting. Galatians chapter 6, verse 14, he says, As for me, may I never boast about anything except the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. What's he saying right there? He's saying, you know what? You know what? And if you read more in this chapter, he's saying, if anybody could boast about something in their life or this or that in their life, then yeah, I could. But you know what? I've chosen never to boast about everything, never to find my value and my significance in my, my accomplishments, never to find my value and my significance in what I'm wearing, never to find my value or in significance in, in what I've learned and the degree that I have, never to find the value and significance in the way that I look, all these different things by which we compare ourselves to. And he goes, no, man. I cannot do that. I will not do that. In fact, the only thing that I will choose to ever boast about in life is not something I've done for myself, but it's something that he has done for me. The cross of Jesus Christ. He says, because of that cross, my interest in this world has been crucified. And the world's interest in me has also died. In other words, the, the world might not think so much about me either. But you know what? That doesn't really matter to me anymore because I'm more interested in what he thinks about me. I'm more interested in how he sees me and what he wants for me in my life. And so I don't compare. I don't compare. I told you guys several years ago this happened to me, and I, I, was, uh, I was walking through Publix, Grocery shopping one day, and as I'm walking through, getting just minding my own business, getting my stuff here and there, um, I happened to notice I kind of had a stalker. And what I mean by stalker is uh, everywhere I went, this guy showed up. And, and it was like he kept, he was watching me so carefully and just kept looking at me. And, and I, I'd run into him, I noticed him, and he'd smile at me, and I'd smile back at him and just kind of nod and nod. And we'd go to another area, and, and boom, there he was again, there he was again, just everywhere. And finally got to the produce section. And I'm in the produce section, I see him across the way, here he is again, and suddenly he starts making his way towards me. I'm thinking, okay, okay, this is weird, what's going on? And he has a smile on his face, and he walks up to me, and he says, What's your name? Do I know you? 
And I'm thinking, I, I don't know. I don't know if I know you or not. Um, I don't know. Maybe you know me from church. Maybe you know me. Uh, I, I, and, and he goes, what's your name? And I told him my name. He goes, oh, man. <laughs> For a second there, I thought you were Chipper Jones. <laughs> Chipper Jones? Wow. I got to tell you guys, I, I walked out of there going, me and Chipper. That's right. <laughs> me and Chipper, man. Chipper Jones, that's pretty cool. But over the last couple years, since he did that, I, I've, I've had moments where I've kind of compared myself to Chipper, you know? I've, I've, I've kind of come, you know, this guy thought I was Chipper. Me and Chipper, we're like twins, right? And I started comparing myself to Chipper. And then the more I compared myself to Chipper, the more I, well, I, I, I'm not Chipper. <laughs> Chippers, wow. Chipper's got a lot more than me. You know, you know Chipper's got, uh, he's got more fans than me. Chipper, Chipper's got more money by far than me. Chipper's got more athletic talent than me. I mean, darn it. Chipper's even got more hair than me. <laughs> Chipper's so much more. And I'm so much less. Do you see how that comparison goes? It does me no good to compare myself to Chipper. And here's the deal. As you go through life comparing yourself to people around you, there will always be a Chipper in your life. There will always be somebody who, they look like they've got so much more than me because they got more than me and I don't have as much as them that I'm so much less. And the enemy starts to speak to our hearts right there and says, yeah, you are less. Oh, you, you are insignificant. Oh, you, you just don't even realize how unworthy you are. And we take it and receive it and believe it and walk in that. And, and that just gets our, that just gets our uh, discontentment going all the more. That gets us revving up. What do I need? What can I get? How can I search out? How can I find some significance of any sort in my life? Because of that comparing myself. But all that we would realize that God did not make two chippers. He made a chipper and he made a bow. And Bo is not to be chipper, and chipper is not to be Bo. And you are not to be him, and he is not to be you. And you're not to be her, and she's not. You have been created by God in the way that God wanted to create you. And any time we compare ourselves and say, I'm less, then I'm saying to God, wow, you messed up. But God did not mess up. And God made you the way he made you for a reason. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 12. Paul says, For we dare not class ourselves or compare ourselves with those who commend themselves. Let me pause right here and tell you what was going on by which he said this. Paul, leader in the church. Paul, pastor of the church. The apostle Paul is sitting in prison and he starts to hear from other people saying, Hey, you know what, Paul? We like that pastor better than we like you as a pastor. We like him as a leader of the church better than, than you as a leader of the church. Paul, the church we go to now is so much better than the church you go to. Paul, what do you think of that? And Paul says, I think it's really silly. I think it's ridiculous. I think it's foolish. I think it's a waste of time. It's unwise, Paul says. We don't, we don't waste our time comparing ourselves pastor to pastor, businessman to businessman, teacher to teacher. Whatever it is, we do not compare, waste our time through living lives of comparing ourselves to others. He says, but they measuring themselves by themselves and comparing themselves among themselves are not wise or silly, or foolish, or ridiculous. Resist comparing myself to others. Let me give you another little secret right here. Another little secret I want to challenge you with. Um, and this secret is this. 
What happens, first of all, when, when you see something that somebody's got that's nice that you don't have? When that happens, do you go, oh, I've got to have that? When that happens, do you go, I wish that was me and not them? Or are you able to say, good for them and enjoy it with them? It's called the secret of being able to admire without having to acquire. Admire without having to acquire. I can admire that and I can enjoy that for them. I don't have to have it for myself to be able to enjoy it for them. Admire without having to acquire. You see that person, they got that brand new car. Whoo, that's a nice car. And the temptation is, well, I wish I had that car. Instead, flip it around and say, they got the car, but you know what? I don't have the payment. <laughs> and that helps me to enjoy <laughs> that car for them. Admire without having to acquire. So that's the first one. Resist comparing myself to others. Now, it, it's not enough for me just to say, stop it, okay? And I'm going to say stop it. Stop comparing yourself. Stop comparing yourself. Stop comparing yourself. But here's the deal. We can't just stop something and not fill it with something else. If we just stop something, we're going to find ourselves gravitating right back to it. Instead of just stopping comparing ourselves to others, we've got to fill it with something else. And that's what number two is right here. The first one, resist comparing myself to others. Number two, rejoice in what I do have. Learn to rejoice in what I do have. There's a game that we all play, and I want to play this little game right now, and here it is. I'm going to say a phrase, and I want you to fill in the blank. Here's the phrase. Listen, I'll be happy when, and you fill in the blank in your mind. I'll be happy when. We play this all the time in our minds, don't we? And somebody in here might be going, I'll be happy when I finally get that house of my dreams. I'll be happy when I finally get that car that I've had my eye on for so long. I'll be happy when I finally get that boyfriend. I'll be happy when, and we play that game, and, and happiness is always out here, but it never comes to our door right here. What are you waiting on? What are you waiting on? Why, why can you not be happy here and now today? And the way that we can is we choose to rejoice, we choose to be happy, and we choose to be happy here in this moment. But what do we have to be happy in? Well, here's the secret again, okay? Philippians chapter 3, verse 1, he says, Whatever happens, my dear brothers and sisters, Paul says, rejoice in the Lord. Rejoice in who? In the Lord. Rejoice in the Lord. He says, I never get tired of telling you these things, and I do it to safeguard your faith. What's he talking about rejoicing in the Lord? I think it's kind of like this. We look around and we notice the blessings that we have in our life. How many of you, real quick, can raise your hand and say, I've got some blessings in my life. And here's the deal. We've all got these blessings in our life, and, and for a moment we can rejoice in the blessings that have been given in our life, but too often we get so focused on the blessing and forget about the blesser, the one who gave us those good things. My kids, when they were little, um, they're in school, and I would have to every once in a while travel to to some other place, maybe to speak or do a conference. And, and so I'd get on a plane and I'd travel uh, to some really uh, exotic, awesome places. And, and while I'm there, I, I, would, I would decide, you know what, I'm going to get my kids some gifts. I'm going to get some, uh, my, my kids some gifts unique to this area because I want to be able to come back home and bring them to them. And, and they'll really enjoy these things. And so I, 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 I'd go to little craft bazaars in certain countries or, or I'd go uh, in the airport just before we're about to get on the flight. And I'd, I'd look there trying to find something specific to bring my kids back for. But, but we, I'd get back to the airport there's the family. They're there meeting me. Kids, look, they'd run up to them. They'd hug me, Daddy, Daddy, Daddy. You're home, you're home, you're home. And then I'd present the gifts. But I, I started to notice that, that my kids started wanting me to leave more. 
Dad, when you going somewhere? Come on, Dad, when you leaving? Why? Because they knew I'd bring a gift. And they got more interested then in the gift than the giver of the gift. And so often I think we find ourselves in that same scenario where we look around and we, we get so all about the gifts rather than the giver of the gift. But here he says, learn, learn to rejoice in the giver of the gift. Learn to rejoice in the Lord. Let me illustrate it to you this way. And this is a habit I, I believe we, we should all be in, get into. Uh, but, but it's this, uh, cheese dip. Mexican cheese dip, okay? Now, I know I'm going to talk about it, and everybody's going to go out and eat Mexican as soon as it's over here today, all right? But you know that cheese, how many of you like cheese dip? And the, oh, man, you know? Okay, so, so a little bowl of cheese dip, and, and here is the habit, is, is start thanking God, the source of your cheese dip. Well, you say, the source of my cheese dip? What are you talking about? Okay, you got the cheese dip right there. You know what? You know what I'm thankful for? I'm thankful for the waiter who just brought this cheese dip to my table. And I'm thankful for the, 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 the cook back there who heated the cheese dip up so it's all nice and melty for me. And I'm thankful for the truck driver who delivered the cheese dip to the restaurant. And wait a second now, keep going. I'm thankful for the farmer who milked the cow that would provide the cheese dip for the trucker to bring it to the restaurant, for the cook to cook it, for the waiter to bring it to my table. Oh, wait a second now. I am thankful for the cow that the farmer milked. And I'm thankful for the grass that the cow ate. And I'm thankful for the rain that made the grass grow. Wait a second now. I'm thankful... For God, for my cheese dip. Guys, you can do that with every single thing in life. Why? Because it all comes from him. It all comes from him. Can you choose today, when you go out, and you got your friends there, your family there, and the cheese dip, say, God, thank you for our cheese dip today. And rejoice in it. Rejoice in the Lord because he's the giver of all good things. Philippians 1.12, I want you to know, my dear brothers and sisters, Paul says, that everything has happened to me, that has happened to me here has helped to spread the good news. What's going on right there? You know what Paul's doing right there? Paul probably didn't have any cheese dip to eat that day. Nevertheless, even though he didn't have cheese dip that day, he found a reason in prison to still be thankful. He found a reason in a bad situation to still go, oh, oh wait a second now. Everybody else is looking, looking going, mm, that's a bad situation. And he still, in the middle of all that, found a reason to praise God, to worship him, to be thankful. I remember when my son Chase, a little guy, and I took him on a father-son camping trip to North Georgia mountains. And I went out there, uh, found our spot, set up our tent, got our fishing rods. There was a little fishing pond that we walked to, and we sat there and fished and didn't catch anything at all. And then we packed up, and we started heading back to our camp. And, and on this particular day, we're walking down this long gravel road on the way back to where our tent was set up. And you guys know a gravel road in, in Georgia. It's made of granite, right? Mostly. And so this long gravel road filled with pieces of granite. Uh, and, and as we're walking along, suddenly my son walking behind me goes, Dad, look at this rock. And I turned around and he reached down in the middle of this gravel road and picked up a piece of gravel. Now there are millions of pieces of gravel on this road. And he picked up a piece of gravel and goes, Dad, you got to check this out. Look at this rock. And now at this point in time, I'm going, my son might not be the brightest here, you know. 
I mean, come on, man. It's just a piece of gravel on a gravel road. And he keeps going on, dad, 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 look, look, look. And so being the dad that I am, I said, let me see. Come here, let me see. Let me check this out. And he goes, just look at it. And I looked at it, and it's a piece of gravel. He goes, no, dad, look at it. It's a piece of gravel. He said, dad, look at it. And as I held it up and looked even closer, I suddenly for the first time saw mixed in the granite were little bright red pieces of crystal rock. Ruby. Rubies, little tiny. And suddenly I go, oh, wow, Chase, that is so, that is really cool. Why do I tell you that? As, as we get older and we go through life, we quit seeing. We quit seeing, don't, do we not? We quit seeing the, the beauty, beauty all around us. The beauty in so many places and so many areas. We just think it's a long, boring gravel road. What do I got to be thankful for? <sighs> just a bunch of gravel. But for somebody to come along and say, let me show you the ruby here. Let me show you the beauty in the middle of all this. Have you quit seeing? Have you quit seeing the, the beauty in your spouse? Have you quit seeing the beauty in that child? Have you quit seeing the beauty in your job? That for so long you wanted that job and you got that job, now you're going, I don't want the job. Have you quit seeing the beauty in the small things, the simple things, the beauty in just a meal, a meal? Oh, that we would, that we would see again and celebrate and thank God for what it is that he has given to us to rejoice in the Lord. Philippians chapter 3, verse 8, look what it says. Yes, everything, Paul says, is <clears throat> worthless. Circle the word worthless. When compared with the infinite value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. You see, when we know him and make him our priority then everything else becomes so small and insignificant as we celebrate him. Worthless, worthless, worthless. You know, you know what that makes me think of? And I've told you guys this before. I'm not going to go into the long story of how it all happened. But uh, uh, when I think of worthless, I think of dung. Dung. How many of you know what dung is? You know what dung is. Good, good, good. Uh, and I told you guys this before, one day I'm walking through the woods where I walk often and I suddenly see a little beetle at my feet and it's going here, there, back and forth. And all the, it's a dung beetle and the dung beetle is walking on its front legs and with its back legs pushing around this big ball of dung, bigger than it was. And it's just all over the place pushing around this ball of dung and as I'm watching it, I felt like God yelled to me, hey, don't be a dung beetle. Dung beetle? You know, we, 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 we look at a dung beetle and go, how foolish, but how many of us, we accumulate all this dung, and we work so hard to collect some more dung, and, and I envy your dung, I covet your dung, I wish I had that dung, and one day I'm going to get my own dung, I'm going to hold on to my dung, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to store my dung in my attic and in my basement, and I'm going to protect my dung, I'm going to put security cameras up. I'm going to collect even more dung, and when I collect more dung, I don't have enough room in my, my basement and in my attic, and so i got to go rent a unit to put my extra dung in. Paying a lot of money to keep that dung. And i got all this dung, and, and then I die. And my kids fight over who gets my dung. Don't be a dung beetle. Don't make the stuff of this world more valuable than it really is. But focus on the true value, he says, infinite value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. Number three, 
Number one was resist comparing myself to others. Number two, rejoice in what I do have. Number three, release what I have to help others. Release what I have to help others. 1 Timothy 6, 17 through 19, it says, teach those who are rich in this world. Let me pause right there and, and, and do this for me. If you live in the United States of America, raise your hand. You know, you know what raising your hand means right there? Is that you're rich in this world. You are rich in this world. It says if you, he says, teach those who are rich in this world not to be proud and not to trust in their money, which is so unreliable. Their trust should be in God who richly gives us all that we need for our enjoyment. He says, tell them to use their money to do good. They should be rich in good works and generous to those in need, always being ready to share with others. By doing this, they will be storing up their treasure as a good foundation for the future so that they may experience true life. What you storing up? Are you storing up? Are you packing it away up there rather than packing it away down here? Jesus tells a story of, of, of a, a wealthy, wealthy man who had a really good year. Crops came in, and it was a boomer year for him. And so he says to himself, wow, it's been so good this year. You know what? I'm going to pack this away, but then I'm going to go and I'm going to store up. I'm going to build bigger barns and store up even more stuff for myself here on this earth. And Jesus says, and what a fool, because the very night's life is taken from him. What, what's he getting at? What's he getting to? He's saying, listen, you're not going to be able to take it with you. And if you live in such a way that it's all about here, you're not going to be living in such a way that's really about there. That eternity. Making a difference there. What is it that I can use here is the question and leverage it so that I have something there. I have rewards there for what I've done with what I have here. Am I taking the stuff here and enjoying what I can do with it here and making a difference in somebody else's life. I went to Walmart yesterday. I always go to Walmart for some reason on Saturday. I went to Walmart yesterday, and as I'm walking into Walmart, there's a big sign I noticed that they have out there on the outside of the building, not too far from where the garden center is that you walk in. The big sign said, the joy shop, not the toy shop. But it said the joy shop. And I thought, what is the joy shop? I don't know what the joy shop is. So I walked in there with my buddy walking around Walmart. And I looked over. They had another big sign inside over all the Christmas stuff. It's called the joy shop. And I thought to myself, has anybody ever really found joy by shopping there? And a lot of you are going, no, man, you can't go out and purchase joy. And you're right. You can't go out there and purchase that kind. Of, but uh, you know what? I stopped for a second. I, I remembered. I remembered somebody who was getting joy from the joy shop. I ran into him in the parking lot. It was maybe two, three years ago. And there he was right outside the garden center of the joy shop. And he had joy all over his face. And, and I, I know why he had joy all over his face because he had gone in and bought up every bicycle that they had and was loading it in a truck to be able to give it away to kids who might not have a bicycle at Christmas. Some of you know him. His name's Steve Zinn. And I stood there with Steve Zinn and as he's loading up these bicycles and, and there was somebody who got some joy from the joy shop. But it wasn't because he himself was going to ride all those bikes, was it? No. The joy came in the giving. And, and I remember another time some joy at the joy shop where, where um, there were all these angels on the angel tree out there. And, and somebody had given 
a whole bunch of money for us to fill every need that every child was going to have at Christmas time. And so me and several of the other staff members were going through Walmart and man, we're just filling up these buggies and we have so much joy because we know that it's going to go to somebody in need. That's when you find joy in the joy shop, right? How about you? Have you been able to find that kind of joy? I'm telling you, it's not like any other. Oh, yeah, yeah, I know on Christmas, and, I, and I'm just like, Ooh, whoo, let's get up at 3 a.m., run downstairs, see what Santa brought me. And there's a little bit of joy in that, man. Wow, this is great. This is fun. But the real joy, the real joy that we find in life is when we can see somebody in need and go and meet that need with what God has blessed us already with. Find a way. Find a way. Release what you have to help others. And then finally, number four, refocus on what's really going to last. Refocus on what's really going to last. Let me ask this question. Think carefully. Other than stuff, what will you leave on this earth when you leave it? Other than stuff, what will you have left on this earth once you leave it? Heard about a funeral in an exclusive section of town. An extremely, extremely wealthy widow had died. And there's one person standing looking over her casket who says to another person, Wow, she had so much to live for. And the other person said, no, she had so much to live on, but nothing to live for. What will we do that will last and last and last and last? Way beyond us. 2 Corinthians 4.18, we fix our attention not on the things that are seen, not on the catalogs, not on the photos, not on, but on things that are unseen. What can be seen lasts only for a time, but what cannot be seen lasts forever. And I'll finish with this this morning. An extremely wealthy man died. He, he was the collector of some very, very fine art, the Picassos and even the Rembrandts. His art was coveted by people all around the world that he had collected over the years. But he died and when he died, they kind of had a dilemma because his son had died years before him. And so there was nobody to give all of his wealth to. Nobody would inherit it. But there was going to be an estate sale. The date was scheduled and, in fact, people from all over the world having heard of this auction flew in to be able to have the possibility of maybe purchasing one of those fine pieces of art that was worth so, so very much. But there on the on date of the sale, the auction, everybody crowded in to the arena. The art was all put up in front and people began to, began to look and decide which one it was that they were going to bid on and and the auctioneer bangs his gavel to begin the auction. But what they bring out first to sell was a small child-drawn picture, kind of like one you would put on your refrigerator when you're proud of something your child drew. And the auctioneer said this is a picture that was drawn by the man's late son. 
that he valued so much. And we'd like to just start off by presenting this for sale. Well, some people kind of snickered. Some people kind of laughed about it. Some people kind of shook their heads. What are we doing here? And the auctioneer said, any, any bids, any bids on this piece of art? And there were no bids. Everybody's waiting for the good stuff. A few awkward moments went by, and that's when down the aisle walks this elderly gentleman. As he approaches the front, the auctioneer recognizes him as having been the gardener of the wealthy man that had died. And, and he, had, he had spent days playing with that child, getting to know him. He decided that he wanted something to remember that boy by. And so he reaches in his pocket and pulls out a few measly dollars. And the auctioneer bangs his gavel down and, and says, sold to the gentleman right here. He collects his piece of art and he begins to walk back. And, and everybody else kind of sits up like, all right, let's get on with this now. And that's when the auctioneer bangs his gavel again and says, Auction over. Everybody's confused. What? what? What's happened? And he explains, he said, in his will, the wealthy owner said, whoever buys my son's art inherits it all. Whoever accepts the son inherits the kingdom, all of it, to live in for eternity. Let's bow in a word of prayer. Do you know his son? Have you accepted his son, Jesus? Friend, if you haven't, here, now, today. Jesus is the only thing that can truly satisfy the heart. Right where you sit, talk to him. He hears you, he knows your thoughts, your prayers. And say, okay, yes, today, Jesus, I'm asking you to come into my life and forgive me of my sin. Be my God, my Savior, my friend, forever and ever. Save me, Jesus, please. And friend, when you pray that prayer and you mean it with your heart, the Bible says you can know you have eternal life. You can know that he's yours and you're his forever and ever and ever. So say, thank you. Thank you, Jesus, for saving me. And let him and him alone satisfy the discontented heart. Father, I thank you for those who this morning received your son. I thank you for the joy that comes in knowing that we're yours. We belong to you as your dear children now. And you have poured out all the good things for us to enjoy. Help us to do that. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Hey, James, what's up, man? Hey, how's it going? Yeah, awesome. give, give a hand. A lot of you, how many of you guys were here for...